Well, yeah, I'm Jackie, and I'm from North Dakota, and I'm a geologist. And uh, yeah, I was at the University of uh, Chile here in Santiago, downtown, and working with Dr. Martin Reich, who's a geochemist there as a professor. So, so my presentation is kind of broken up into three parts, and those are just a couple pictures I took just for fun to show you guys the animals. <laughs> But from April to May, roughly, I did a lot of literature review, reading about the geology of Chile, the types of things that are going on, uh, mostly subduction related to fluids. And then uh, I also did like a photo session with pyrites, and I'll pass these around. I actually found these pyrites. So they're the biggest ones I've ever seen that I've found. And I'm really excited. But pyrite is, as we'll see, is very important in hydrothermal and hydrothermal alteration and mining, and it's a really important mineral. So I did that the first couple months. And then from July to October, I really worked on my project, which, like almost everyone else here, kind of changed a little bit due to road bumps. And I'm going to tell you guys some of my results from that. And then from October until now, I've basically been traveling around Chile, seeing some geology, and helping a student with some field work in El Patio, so I'll, I'll show you guys pictures and samples from that. So first, the pyrites that are being passed around. Pyrite is an iron sulfide mineral, FES2, and uh, what I did was I helped Daniele Tardani, who's the first author here. He's a um, postdoc, no, he's a uh, graduate student getting his doctorate at the University of Chile under Dr. Martin Ray. And, uh, so, and he's actually just finishing up right now, like really, really soon. He's going to graduate and be a doctor. But right away, he was working on this paper, the studying the decoupling of uh, a couple elements um, and the link between the pyrite composition and fluid changes in an active system, Tolaca Volcano, close to Tumuco. Um, and what I did is I took pictures of the pyrites in the SEM, the SEM, which is a scanning electron microscope like Kyle talked about. And uh, this is kind of what rocks look like under the um, scanning electron microscope, which is a microscope that takes pictures with electrons. So it's pretty cool. And what happens is you can tell the different minerals apart because the electrons are brighter, the, the spots appear brighter. Uh, when you have heavier minerals. So pyrite is heavier than the surrounding matrix. So in these pictures, it's the, the white, uh, really white uh, spots. So I did that. And then what was really interesting is we were looking at the copper arsenic decoupling. And I did catch some arsenic in some of the pyrite samples. So that was, that was pretty cool. So what his work finally showed, this is just a snapshot, which is kind of cool, just to show kind of how minerals can be used in um, how the mining and how the fluid composition is changing in systems. So here's the pyrite grain. This is taken with an EMPA, which is a different type of electron microscope. And you can see that there's zones of arsenic-rich um, arsenic rich pyrite and then separated these copper rich so it's definitely a decoupling going on. So that was just kind of a, a cool uh, offshoot that I did. And then my project, um, it was going to be more focused on the the actual like chemical cycling and fluid cha changes within the Talwaka geothermal system using uh, geochemical modeling, but I didn't have um, some water samples and compositions that I needed. I still, because a grad student, or no, a, an undergrad took samples in like July, but the lab is like super backlogged and I don't know if he even has his data yet. <laughs> so I decided to go back and work with some other data that um, Daniele Tardani had taken in 2013 and 2012, I think. And this is on superficial waters. So my project title is kind of the geochemistry of these thermal surface waters in the Southern Volcanic Zone of Chile, and the implications for the changes in chemistry seen throughout the region. And I tried to uh, um, 
relate those to the structural controls that we see, like the faults, the fault systems, the, the rock types, that kind of thing. And uh, right now it's, it's being under, it's being reviewed by some of the co-authors and um, the principal objectives were to first understand the surface water chemistry because in the Southern Volcanic Zone there's been a ton of work relating like the deep processes going on, the deep waters, the deep surf, uh, the deep magmas, fluids circulating, and uh, tectonics, but there hasn't been really a study on the surface, the surface manifestations, and there's a ton of them. So, so that was the first objective. And the second objective is to investigate the effects again of the structural controls. So here is the, the area of study. We have um, Nevada State Chian, which is where Started, that's the northernmost point, and the southernmost point is down here, kind of by its north of Orsorno. So we're from roughly like 39 or 37 degrees to 41 or so. And so here's the Arica Pucon area here, just to kind of orient. And Tawaka is here. And uh, in this in this graph, the waters are the points here, the blue circles and the uh, the squares and the pink circles are the water samples. There are 30 in total that Daniele took uh, a few years ago. And they are uh, classified here according to the type of thermal water that that, um, that is related to their chemistry that I'll talk about in a, in a slide or so. And uh, they're also um, divided by what type of fault system is they're primarily controlled by. So in this photo, we have the black lines and the black dots. Um, those are the those are part of the, the Linquini Offkey fault system, and that fault system is very related. It's a back arc um, subduction fault. So it's it's basically it's like a strike slip almost. So it's just moving like this because the principal stress is like this. The um, subduction angle is kind of coming in like this which is causing the rocks to kind of slide like that. And then the red are a much older fault system called the ALFS. It has a really long, really long name. <laughs> but it's more, it's, it's much more deep. Like the, the link we, the LOFS fault system, it kind of reaches all the way from basically the mantle to the surface because it's a very active fault system. But the ALFS is more, it's older and it's very badly oriented with respect to the stress field. So it's kind of oriented exactly perpendicular. So we're going to see the implications for that on fluid a little bit. Um, so yeah, again, there were the waters, the 30 waters were divided by association of the fault. So the, the samples with the red star next to them have the, are associated with the red, the ALFS. And I did this, I did this um, dividing based on more detailed maps and other work done in the past. And then also they were divided by the, the chemical composition. So they were based mostly on concentrations of ions like calcium, chlorine, sulfate, stuff like that. We'll see the graph in a sec. And uh, so this is just kind of a rundown of the different types of water. So we had the acid sulfate waters, which there were nine of. Um, neutral chloride waters, there were 19, they're the most common type. And then we had two bicarbonate rich waters. And you can see the, the acid sulfate waters are very acid. And the chloride waters are more neutral and the bicarbonates are kind of in the middle to more uh, basic. And the temperature also changes throughout here, so the acid sulfate waters were much higher in temperature generally. And so this, this graph, and I will point out different things on it as we go on, but I first want to explain what you're looking at. So each column is a certain anion or anion group and or cation. And up here we have the major um, major ions. So these are present in parts per million. They're kind of dominant in the chemistry. And these ones down here at the bottom are the trace elements. So they're, they're present in parts per billion. And you can see that on the concentration. So this is the law of concentration scale. This is in parts per billion, this is in parts per million. Can I ask a question? Yeah. 
So this is all like hot spring water? Yes. So those temperatures are really high. So yep. they're not from like lakes? No. All hot no, this is all yeah, from hot springs. Thermal manifestations. And the blue dots show the neutral chloride waters, the orange ones are the acid sulfate, and the yellow, the two yellows are the bicarbonate waters. So in the acid sulfate waters, we can see that sulfate is the dominant ion, um, ion uh, anion. It also is pretty high in magnesium and barium. While in the um, chloride, the neutral chloride waters, chloride is dominating, the dominant anion. And we also have relatively higher concentrations of the green circled elements. And then the bicarbonate waters, obviously, again, are enriched in bicarbonate anion, and they also have relatively high concentrations in cations. But I can't really say too much about it because there's only two, but generally speaking, that's what, that's what their, their chemistry is. And this is kind of, this is a picture of, uh, it's called a Piper diagram, and this is comparing the, an the cations that you have and the anions that you have, and then it plots them in a, through a matrix transform into this diamond. And this is just kind of to show that, yes, okay, the waters are very different in chemistry. You have the two alveolars here, the bicarbonates, and then clusters of the acid sulfate and neutral chloride. And then um, to find the link between the chemistries and the, the, fault, the fault systems, the LOFS and the ALFS again, um, I wanted to just go through again kind of what are the characteristics of these fault systems so we can better understand what their potential um, effects could be on surface water chemistry. So the orientation relative to the principal stress in the LFS is very, very, it's preferential. It's, it's forming because of the subduction. It's perfectly aligned. While the ALFS is severely bad. It's very bad. Um, and this has implications for the magmas and the fluids, the magmatic fluids deep within the crust. And due to the preferential orientation, it's a very uh, permeable pathway. You have very primitive uh, fluids and magmas forming. And there's, the, the also, there's also a bunch of volcanoes kind of aligned on either the uh, ALFS or the LOFS. And so the magmas on top of the LOFS, con primarily controlled by the LOFS, generally have mo more primitive signatures because they're better connected to the mantle. And the L ALFS has more crustal contamination because the fluids kind of get trapped in a way. And uh, the permeability, the vertical permeability, again, high in the, in the LOFS and low in the ALFS. And this picture, which is taken from Sanchez Alfaro, um, just kind of shows, because he did work, it's very similar to this, in just the Via Rica volcano area. And this is kind of the model that he came up with to show how the differences in faults have affected the fluid samples within that area. So also this work was kind of to extrapolate that and see if it still fit through the whole region. And so this is a, um, it's kind of like a stress indicator, like where the principal stresses are, these two and you can see here that the stress is coming here because the stresses are going to be the same in every in both pictures because it's the same. But here we have kind of an opening going on. As the plates are sliding past, you're getting kind of a, an opening, which uh, affects the again the magmas and the fluids. And then in the ALFS, you have more of a a pocket sitting deeper, which also explains the um, crustal contamination and lower permeability. So, some results. First, I, since I was only looking at a limited number of trace elements, um, I looked first at the conservative elements lithium, cesium, and rubidium. And these are elements that are way on the left side of the periodic table. They're, they have a charge of plus one. They're similar to sodium, which is a major element in this case, but these are the minor components. And uh, so what you would expect to see with these elements is that they're incompatible in mineral structures. And they're leached very easily from the rock, which means if you have an acid solution and it comes in contact with a rock, these elements are going to be um, taken out of the rock very easily because they're incompatible, mostly. And 
They generally will have a strong relationship with chlorine if the water has been if the water has had a fast, relatively quick upflow, if that makes sense, because chlorine also is relatively incompatible in minerals as well. And so what we saw was first I divided the, the samples into water type or fault system. And so on the left side is the water type. So the blues, the blue dots are the, the neutral chloride. The little orange squares are the acid sulfate, and the two black diamonds are the bicarbonate water. So, and we see a really strong correlation between the uh, lithium, cesium, and rubidium, and chlorine. So these are all plotted against chlorine. And I put in the R squared values. They're pretty close to 1. And when we divide it by fault system, it's a little less clear, but there's still a very strong correlation between lithium and chlorine in the LOFS, which are the yellow dots, and the ALFS waters, which are the green dots. So it becomes a little more convoluted, but that's also because it's really hard to tell where what kind of um, structures are controlling a system in the field, because <laughs> most of the faults that are mapped are inferred. And so, and also, you saw on the map that the LOFS may be dominant throughout the whole system, but the ALFS also cuts that. So there's there can be signals that are mixed. It's a it's a real system. There's going to be a lot of speculating. But generally speaking, when I did the R squared values for the ALFS waters, they were below 0.65, and some had zero, like zero. They were not related at all. So this provides evidence that uh, this provides evidence that there is a correlation between the trace elements lithium, cesium, and rubidium, and chlorine in the uh, in the waters that have more of a, a fast, efficient upflow with more permeability, more uh, with a higher uh, vertical permeability pathway, and that generally manifests itself in the NaCl waters. And also, the conservative elements, chlorine and boron, I also looked at. And what I did with this was, again, I separated the waters between water type, the chemical the chemistry, and the structural domain that is controlling the manifestation. And I took the chlorine and boron ratio. And chlorine and boron are also both incompatible. They're very, they're very, uh, they dissolve really easily in water. So if you have very fast upflow again, you're going to have high ratios. And so what we have here are the chlorine boron ratios for the acid sulfate waters are generally low. And the NaCl waters are much higher. And we had two outliers, the yellow dots here that were at um, Nevada State Chiang. And uh, I'll tell you why I think that is in a second. And then also we can see here that the ALFS waters are generally lower than the, the LOFS waters. And this is again a log scale. Um, and so the sulfate waters are also almost always only one sample that wasn't associated with the volcano. And what that, what that means is that there's been magmatic development underneath or very close by. And um, when, a mag, when, a, when, a mag, when a magma chamber is degassing, it releases a lot of boron. And so what, the one reason that acid sulfate waters here have a really low ratio is that they have a lot of boron and relatively low amounts of chlorine. So that's why acid sulfate waters have a low ratio. And that kind of, it also is slightly less clear, but it could be the reason that the ALFS waters are also having a low ratio, if that makes sense. Um, and then also this graph, this, uh, this diagram shows lithium, chlorine, and boron concentrations. The, the chlorine and boron are weighted because lithium is a trace element. And so you need to shift. Uh, if I didn't weight them, all the points would be on this one. So you can weight it to kind of see more of a clear picture. And what this is saying is that here's the initial rock ratio that you'd expect to see. This is a range for a bunch of rock types. And so if you didn't have any loss of lithium or any gain in boron or chlorine, you should be close to this point. 
but again, here is this is this arrow showing the samples have been enriched in either chlorine or boron, and we can see that almost all of the acetosulfate waters are clustered in the boron corner, and two are up here. Consequently, the two that were the outliers in this this diagram. Yeah, so these two are the outliers here. And so my theory on this is that groundwater um, mixing can introduce a lot of chlorine to a water, to a groundwater, to a uh, uh, fluid. So if you have a lot of mixing with groundwater, you're going to shoot up into this chlorine part of the diagram. So my theory on that is that while these two points are uh, located at the Nevada State Chian site, which is only controlled by the ALFS. It's, it, there's no, it's too far north of the LOFS. And so, um, and uh, it's just so much, so much complicated things. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the ALFS, like I said before, has a lot of crustal contamination. It has, there's been evidence from other papers that this system, these types of systems are very controlled by transient pulses of fluid. So you get, you know, you get a fracture in the rock and it shoots up a bunch of fluid that could be enriched in boron, could be enriched in chlorine, or chlorine. and then uh, add to that you have some groundwater mixing with chlorine. And so these two samples could be kind of a manifestation of the irregular behavior of the ALFS faults. Because the RV sample here is also located very close by to these two samples. They're all at Nevada State Chihan. So I think that in that area, it's a very complex relationship between the fluid pulses that are controlled by the structural elements. And I kind of, yeah, I talk about that more in depth in my paper, but that's kind of <laughs> the gist. And uh, yeah, the other, the neutral chloride waters, the blue squares, um, are kind of more spread out. And it's interesting that most of these points down here are also have a slight um, association with the ALFS fault system. So they could be getting some of this boron release during the, uh, the volcanic degas. So to conclude, the importance of the ALFS and the, and the, A the, ALFS and the LFS manifests itself in the, the development and lack thereof of magmatic chambers and the, um, the addition of agua of uh, meteoric waters also influences the, uh, the chlorine boron ratios. So those two kind of things play out. And here I have kind of a very, it's, a, it's basically the summary of the two things that are happening with the water. So in the ALFS, you have very low vertical permeability, while in the, AL, in the LOFS, you have high vertical permeability. And in the ALFS, you have the development of magmatic chambers and the subsequent degassing of those chambers, which is enriched in boron. So therefore, you have a chlorine-boron ratio much lower. And there's no correlation between the elements, the lithium, cesium, rubidium, and chlorine in these waters. While in the LO LOFS, you have a much more efficient upflow due to the orientation of the fault. And you can have a much deeper penetration of the meteoric waters and uh, higher chlorine-boron ratios and relationships between the conservative elements and chlorine. So that's kind of the gist of that. And then the next part of my presentation is more just pictures and stuff. So if you guys have any quick questions about the project. In super layman's terms, like what are what is the, you know, what why why does why do I care about this? Oh, yes. Like what's the what, what what is like why does it matter? Right. This. <laughs> this no, that's a good question. I was going to talk about. That. Oh, sorry. But um, yeah. So these are thermal waters at the surface in the southern volcanic zone. So if we can kind of divide the waters into different. Um, groups based on their chemistry alone, and we can kind of say, oh, they're kind of, they're in this area, they might be related to this fault system, they may be related to the other fault system. 
and that means that they have certain characteristics. Like we saw the acid sulfate waters were high in sulfate. They had high concentrations of magnesium and, and barium, while the other waters, the um, bicarbonate waters, were very rich in other cations. But then you have the um, neutral chloride waters, which are also very high in arsenic and boron and chlorine. And those are things you don't really want to have in your drinking water, really. And so this could have implications for drilling wells. If you know kind of the geology, they could um, better predict where a good source of water could be or where. Um, another important thing is kind of knowing um, like what is the relationship between the surface waters and the chemistry of the waters beneath and the formation of potential ore deposits and uh, mineral resources. And so living at the amount of Sichuan, we drink it's like spring water directly from the mountain, basically. Do you think that was like really high in these bad minerals? It, it could have been. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing they run tests on the water you guys drink. These no, are for no, us. No. No. You're telling no. me. Yeah. Like literally. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
So, and this is a view inside the mine. So they they can literally just extract rock from the side. And this and this is kind of this is a picture of how the deposit formed. It was you can imagine a huge rock, volcanic rock that has been fractured by fluids, and the fluids brought with a bunch of stuff. And then they deposit magnetite and actinolite in the veins. So this is kind of a cool picture. It was too big of a sample. I don't want to carry back. So I don't have this one, but that's kind of how it forms. And then you get zones further away from the actual site of mineralization that are called, this is called a stock work. And this is finer veins. So it's, it's further away from the actual outflow of fluids. So you get smaller veins of magnetite. The second one was Talcuna. This is a mantotype, so it's kind of it's strata bound, so this is a sedimentary rocks. And they mine uh, copper and silver. And it's all below this uh, techo rojo, they called it. And it's an impermeable layer that just basically trapped the fluids that were flowing up that were rich in copper. And so they only look for mineral below this certain formation. And what we did is we did a hike up this mountain that the picture is from, but there was no mineralization in this part. They're exploiting the ore that's further down the valley. And this is a picture of the Tito uh, Rojo. I don't think I have a, I don't have a sample. Oh wait, these two, they, they mine Bornite, and that's a copper mineral. It's a really pretty blue mineral, so you can find it in those two samples. And the third one was uh, Panosilio, which is a scar deposit. I've never been to a scar deposit. It was really, really cool. And uh, they form when you have basically volcanic sedimentary layers like limestones. You have to have limestone with this one. And a huge igneous intrusion comes in, and it's contact metamorphism. So you have this huge igneous complex that is hot and has a lot of, it's kind of cooling as it's um, being in place. And then it comes in contact with these limestones and the sedimentary rock, and it kind of it changes the chemistry due to the intense heat and pressure. So at this deposit, we saw a lot of calcopyrite, and this is where my pyrites were from too. And this sample, it, you get garnet. So garnet, I think, is it's a gem mineral. So it's pretty cool. And the blue mineral, these are. Um, copper minerals that have been oxidized. So they're, they're super gene alteration, really close to the surface, the ground, water, air. Super gene? Yeah, that's the word. Cool word. <laughs> <laughs> it's like very top of the deposit. Um, so yeah, and what we saw here is another open pit mine. And they're, these are just piles of rocks. So you just walk up and I just found all these minerals. It was really and yes, this is kind of a big view. The mine is up in this area. More pictures. And then the, the last one was Carmen de Andicoyo, which is close to the town of Andicoyo. It's like it's like right next to it. So there's kind of a dynamic going on of oh, we're in the town. Don't don't you know blow stuff up on this day. Having <laughs> like a celebration or something. And this is another uh, copper gold porphyry porphyry deposit. And the Los Palambres was also a copper porphyry deposit. And the copper porphyry deposits are like Chile's mine. Like that's where all the big copper comes from. So those are very important for Chile. And they form by uh, uh, fluids, again. Everything has to do with fluids and subduction here. And so you have copper rich fluids coming up and being emplaced and fracturing rock and depositing copper minerals. So this is, again, it's another open pit. And they call this, this copper from porphyry mine, the smallest of the biggest in Chile. And again, I didn't get samples from here because the porphyry, the porphyry, the porphyries aren't that pretty in, in reality. And there's me and my friends at the closet. <laughs> and then here's kind of the pictures of the cores. You, know, you can see all the fractures, and the fractures are usually filled with pyrite or calcopyrite or bornite. And this is kind of what a porphyry is. It's a, 
It's a rock that has huge crystals of one type of mineral. In this place, in this case, it's plagioclase, but a very fine matrix. So they look kind of cool. And then finally, last week I was in El Patio, close to San Pedro de Atacama, and I did work. I helped uh, a student, a postdoc student, collect data for her geyser work. She's like a geophysicist who's studying kind of the dynamics of geyser formation and migration related to faults. And so I was taking GPS points at all the geysers. And this is the two that the two ladies that I worked with. And so that was pretty fun. And this is a sample of Sinter. And Sinter is made of uh, silica. And so what happens with geysers is it's hot, hot water moving through rock underneath. And in this case, it's very silicic rock. It's very high in silica. And so it gets dissolved due to the high temperatures. And geysers occur where you have this equilibrium between pressure, temperature, and uh, the, you get water boiling periodically. And so geysers don't form in many environments. They're very rare. So it's really cool to kind of study them in Chile, the highest geyser field in the world. It's also the third largest in the world. So yeah, that's the end of my presentation. And these are just some of the people I'd like to thank, some of my co-authors, people I've worked with, my professor.